Welcome to The Populist Revolt, an interactive U.S. history tutorial for students like you. At the end of the 19th century, the 1800s, many Americans embraced a new form of politics called populism. It was mostly a movement sparked by farmers and other rural Americans. It can be a tough topic to learn about and make sense of. By the end of this tutorial, you'll understand the very real problems faced by farmers in the late 19th century. You'll understand how these farmers' frustrations became the basis for a political movement, populism, and how a new political party, the People's Party, elected populist candidates to office. You'll understand the complicated debate about the gold standard versus the silver standard and how it reached its peak in the crucial election of 1896. And you'll learn about the legacy of populism in American history. Let's review a few things in order to put populism in its proper context. American life was transforming in some important ways at the end of the 19th century after the Civil War. At its founding, the United States had been an overwhelmingly rural nation with few Americans living in cities. Then, even the biggest American cities didn't compare with those of Europe. Most Americans had been farmers, at least on a small scale, even if they didn't make their living from agriculture. But a century later, the U.S. was rapidly becoming an urban nation. The growing American population swelled by new immigrants centered around large cities. In 1860, 6 million Americans had lived in cities. By 1910, 44 million would, and by 1920, a majority of Americans would be city dwellers. Fewer people chose a lifestyle of farming, and for the millions that still worked in agriculture, times were tough, as you'll soon learn about. As the wealth and population of the nation shifted more to the north and east, rural people, including many who lived in the west and south, began to feel left out of the changing modern America. Some reacted with resentment and anger by revolting against the changes they felt threatened their way of life. After the Civil War, Americans had been encouraged to settle and farm the West. The Homestead Act offered up to 160 acres of free western land to any settlers who would live on it and farm it for a period of five years. Many took advantage of the opportunity, only to find that farming the Great Plains was a tough and unpredictable way to make a living. Farmers might have good seasons and good years, only to find that windstorms, harsh winters, even plagues of grasshoppers might ruin their accomplishments. After the Civil War, the South, the region of the United States once best known for its agricultural production, now struggled as well. Because of high debt, most Southern farms in the late 1800s were worked by people who didn't own the land, sharecroppers and tenant farmers. Agriculture had changed. Gone were the days when farmers could be totally independent and self-reliant, producing for themselves and their local communities and making their own tools and supplies. Instead, farmers increasingly needed to be businessmen to make a living, specializing in one large crop like wheat or cotton, and growing as much of it as possible. Most of the crop would be sold to faraway customers or even in other countries using railroads to transport goods long distances. And agriculture was now more dependent on new technologies and inventions, allowing greater production but requiring farmers to constantly reinvest money in their farms. Because of this, farmers were increasingly linked to the national and even international economies and were sometimes subject to economic forces beyond their easy understanding. At the same time, as farming became more complicated, farmers in the South and West faced economic conditions that seemed to get worse and worse. In a sense, farming had become a victim of its own success. The new Western lands opened up to agriculture led to the overproduction of farm goods. The most basic law of economics says that the more supply there is of something, the less demand there is for it, resulting in lower prices. When the prices at which they could sell their crops dropped, what did farmers do to make the same amount of money? They grew even more. What did that do to prices? They dropped even more. In 1870, a bushel of wheat could be sold for about $1. By the early 1890s, the same amount might sell for 60 cents. In 1870, a pound of cotton could be sold for 15 cents. By the early 1890s, the price had declined to about 5 cents a pound. Prices went up and down as the market fluctuated, but the trend over time was unmistakably downward. Many farmers simply couldn't make a living. They went bankrupt, or their land was repossessed by the banks who owned the mortgages. 
By 1894, for example, almost half the farms in Kansas had fallen into the hands of bankers. Here's a pretty good definition of populism, a political platform seeking to represent the views of ordinary people. There's more to it than that, though. Populist politics often appeal to the frustration and anger, even the resentment of those ordinary people, in this case farmers. You can probably understand why the American farmers you've been learning about felt angry. They worked long, hard hours to feed and clothe their country and the world, but they couldn't get ahead economically. At the same time, in the urban East, Americans involved in big business were doing better than ever. The newspapers were full of stories of millionaire bankers, tycoons, and railroad barons. Politicians in Washington, D.C. were doing all they could to promote the growth of the new industrial economy. But did those businessmen and the politicians also support American agriculture? To farmers, it didn't seem that way. Especially in the West and Midwest, where farmers often lived far from big cities, they had to rely on others to get their goods to market to be sold. Here, the railroad companies had tremendous power. They represented the only way for many farmers to transport and sell their goods, and they charged high prices for their services. In fact, because they were private companies not regulated or controlled by the government, the railroads could charge pretty much whatever they wanted. Farmers also had to pay others to store their crops before and after they were transported, and even handling fees for others to take their goods on and off the trains. Again, these business people charged farmers high prices with no government regulation. The high tariffs passed by Congress hurt farmers as well. Tariffs are duties or taxes charged on products imported into the U.S. from other nations. Think of them as the price other nations have to pay for doing business in the United States. High tariffs meant high prices for foreign goods, so they helped manufacturers because they protected American goods from foreign competition. If it cost more to buy an import, more people bought American. But this didn't help farmers who exported their goods, and high tariffs made it more expensive for farmers to buy factory goods, like plows or tools, that they needed for their farm work. All of this meant that farmers began to feel like their government was conspiring against them. That wasn't really the case. The government of the late 1800s was pro-business, not necessarily anti-farmer. But to hard-working Americans who couldn't seem to catch a break, it seemed like the political status quo needed to change. It was tough for farmers to organize politically. Not only did many live in isolated places, but farmers in general prided themselves on their rugged individualism and self-reliance. Eventually, though, farmers did begin to join forces, believing that it was the only way to challenge a government they thought was hostile to their livelihood. They took some cues from the labor movement. In big cities where factory work dominated, workers had successfully formed unions. Urban workers realized their strength lay in numbers, and organizing together allowed them to negotiate for better wages and working conditions. So farmers formed similar organizations. One was the National Grange of the Patrons of Husbandry, better known as the Grange. Its members, called Grangers, tended to be wealthier, larger farmers. Other organizations, known as Farmers' Alliances, were more local grassroots groups representing smaller farmers. Farmers' Alliances allowed women to be members and assume important leadership roles. A colored Farmers' National Alliance, formed in Texas, represented African-American farmers. Grangers and Alliance members attempted to form cooperative exchanges owned and controlled by farmers. Farmers would be able to buy supplies from the co-ops for reasonable prices, store their crops in warehouses owned by the co-ops, and even obtain loans and credit from co-op-controlled banks. But these efforts were ultimately unsuccessful in fixing the larger problems of agriculture. Many farmers came to believe that they needed even more power in the form of an entirely new political party. Most American farmers at this time had more political loyalty to the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. Generally speaking, the Democrats were seen as the party of rural America and the little guy, while the Republicans were seen as the party of big business and industry. The Republican Party had supported the high tariffs that had hurt farmers economically. But when even the Democrats didn't seem like they were interested in fixing farmers' problems, populist ideas took the form of an entirely new political party, the People's Party. It was also widely known as the Populist Party. Candidates who ran as populists were elected as early as 1890, but the party was officially founded in 1891 and lasted in one form or another until 1908. 
the people's party had its greatest success and influence in the election year of eighteen ninety two the populist candidate for president james b weaver won more than eight per cent of the vote and eleven populists were elected to congress for a third party in the united states that's very successful over the span of its existence candidates of the people's party won the governorships of several states and eventually forty-five congressmen who called themselves populists would be sent to washington d c six of them u s senators two of the best-known populists to serve in congress were tom watson and jerry simpson when the people's party met in omaha nebraska to nominate its candidate in eighteen ninety two its members also voted on a party platform stating the political goals that populists wanted to achieve taken as a whole the platform wanted government to take a far more active role in helping americans who had fallen on hard times like farmers at first many americans laughed at the beliefs of the populist party its ideas seemed extreme and radical compared to those of the two mainstream parties the people's party was also a target because it was so associated with farmers and agriculture urban americans tended to mock the party as a bunch of hayseeds or hicks but within the next few decades many if not most of these radical ideas would become part of the laws of the united states some would even become constitutional amendments in this way the people's party was actually just a little ahead of its time the american economy at this time had a fundamental weakness that hurt farmers especially there was too little money to go around the economy had expanded greatly but there hadn't been a corresponding rise in real hard currency in circulation bills and coins to go along with it think about paper money for a moment if you hold a twenty dollar bill in your hand why is it actually worth that amount what if you held a one dollar bill in the other hand why is one bill worth twenty of the other did it cost twenty times as much to make is it printed on more valuable paper or with nicer ink of course not in the twenty-first century our currency is worth the value printed on it essentially because our government says that's what it's worth and because people have confidence in the currency and the government of the united states in the nineteenth century paper currency represented something more real then the nation's currency was tied to a gold standard this meant you could walk into a bank at any time and exchange your paper dollars for gold coins at a rate of exchange set by the government because gold is a scarce resource nations that use a gold standard are limited as to how much currency they can print after all if money represents gold you can't print more money than you have gold but a worldwide gold production actually dropped between eighteen sixty five and eighteen ninety at the same time that the u s population nearly doubled and industry expanded what else increased during the same time period the production of silver in the united states due to mining in the western states if a silver standard could be introduced allowing cash to be exchanged for silver much more money could be printed than a gold standard alone allowed farmers and populists enthusiastically embraced the idea of a silver standard they had been especially hurt by the tight money supply which made it more expensive to borrow money or pay back loans remember that many farmers were heavily in debt having less currency also kept prices low which hurt farmers as well they wanted to sell their products for higher prices people who desired a silver standard didn't want to do away with the gold standard they wanted both people would be able to exchange their paper money for gold coins or silver coins this was called bimetallism two monies it wasn't even a brand new idea the u s had used a silver standard to print money earlier in its history but it was discontinued in eighteen seventy three around the time farmers started to experience hard times then it was partially brought back a silver purchase act of eighteen ninety actually required the government to purchase silver each year prices rose somewhat as more money was printed and farmers came to associate better times with the silver standard but in eighteen ninety three the nation experienced a severe panic or depression banks closed businesses failed and unemployment soared especially in cities there was a run on banks as many people tried to cash in their dollars for the safest currency gold as a result the nation's gold supply started to run out the president grover cleveland concluded that silver was the problem that was destabilizing the currency he responded to the crisis by repealing the silver purchase act and reinstating a strict gold standard he believed that silver had weakened the currency and caused the crisis whatever the president was hoping to accomplish it didn't work 
The gold supply continued to run out, which meant the U.S. was in danger of going bankrupt. Bimetallism turned into the hot political issue of the 1890s. On one side were the gold bugs, people like Grover Cleveland who wanted a gold standard only. On the other side were silverites, populists and farmers who wanted a silver standard as well. As the 1896 election approached, the People's Party decided to focus on the silver issue exclusively, above all others. They demanded unlimited coinage of all the silver mined in the West, which would increase the currency dramatically. Populists assumed the two major parties would be wishy-washy on bimetallism, giving them an opening to harness the voters' anger and possibly score a victory. But it didn't work out that way. The Republican Party nominated William McKinley, an Ohio conservative who ran on a gold-only platform. But the Democrats nominated a fresh face, a young congressman from Nebraska named William Jennings Bryan. Bryan wasn't expected to win the nomination, but at the Democrats' convention, he captivated the audience with a famous speech in which he fully embraced populist ideas. William Jennings Bryan made the issue of silver versus gold seem like a struggle between good and evil. With words, he painted a picture of an American divide between virtuous Western farmers and greedy Eastern bankers. Burn down your cities and leave our farms, Bryan said, and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms and grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. At the end of his speech, Bryan used religious imagery to spin a phrase still known to Americans today, more than a century later. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. In other words, forcing the gold standard on America would crucify it or cause it to be sacrificed. The populists now had a choice. They could nominate their own presidential candidate, whose views on the money issue would be similar to Bryan's, or they could back the Democrat, who had a better chance of winning. The People's Party chose to nominate William Jennings Bryan as its candidate as well, effectively joining forces with the Democrats for this election. Voters in 1896 really felt like they were at a crossroads. There was such anger and emotion over the Depression and the issue of gold and silver that it seemed to many voters like they lived in two different Americas. McKinley and the Republicans represented business as usual. Bryan, the Democrats, and the Populists represented a new change that McKinley's campaign tried to paint as radical and irresponsible. Bryan crisscrossed the nation by train, giving hundreds of passionate speeches in favor of silver, but McKinley had far more money to spend. Who won? As you can see on this map, Bryan won the blue states of the West and South where agricultural issues were most important to voters, but McKinley won the more populous red states of the Northeast and Upper Midwest. In the end, the electoral vote was 271 to 176 in favor of William McKinley, who would become the next president. Not only was the People's Party's main issue defeated at the polls, but the new party lost most of its identity by fusing with the Democrats in 1896. Really, in some important ways, the Democratic Party had become the populist party by embracing its ideas. The People's Party hung on for the next few elections, but it had lost its chance to make an impact on American politics. Do you remember Tom Watson, the populist congressman from Georgia? He ran as the presidential candidate of the People's Party in 1904 and 1908. By that point, the party had shifted its focus from the problems of farmers and the silver standard to a platform of white supremacy. Watson now ran a campaign opposed to African Americans and Catholics, with little success. Today, historians looking back on populism and the political party that bore its name tend to fall into two camps. Some historians view the populists as forward-thinking liberals. They point out that many ideas labeled populist in the late 19th century became reality as progressive ideas in the early 20th century. In this view, populism won in the long run. Others view populism as a backward-looking emotional reaction to a rapidly changing America in which rural people were losing power. They see farmers as looking back to the good old days that never really existed. In this view, the populists turned out to be losers. The term populist is still alive and well in America today. Whenever a politician or a political party goes out of its way to appeal to the common man or tap into the anger and frustration felt by ordinary Americans, it's often labeled populism.